but I want to just get an update on the film. So it looks like it was finished for Sundance this past January. Yep. And then was it finished for Netflix in May? Yeah, so uh, we had a rare opportunity to open up the film again, which is a love-hate relationship I'm sure the editing and sound team can tell you about. Um, but we ended up being able to do some more editing. We actually cut three minutes out of the film. Oh. Um, and now that was finished in late June and uh, went up on Netflix in July. Oh, fantastic. Okay, because I saw that some of your graphics were from May 2017. So. This mm -hmm. is very recent. The film is yes. just getting out there. Um, so maybe can you just tell us, even in this short period of time between January at Sundance and now, um, what kind of impact are you having with the film? Yeah, so uh, it's been really quite an interesting ride. I think the, the previous film that Jeff made, Chasing Ice, um, when he started making that film, he was a, you know, he was a filmmaker and he didn't really intend to make the film at the beginning. He sort of happened upon the story and um, I think what he realized is he got through this whole process of making a film, it got into Sundance, it won an award, and he thought like, job well done, I did it. Um, and then people kept asking him, what can I do? Uh, what can I do now that I've seen this film and I feel compelled to change? Uh, and I think we weren't really expecting that from the audience. And so we realized that while film has this power to not only you know, influence the way people think, but also influence the way they may act. Uh, and from there, we, we wanted to see what, how, 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 can we, how can we use this film as a tool um, to actually change the way, to move the needle in some way, whether big or small. And uh, we took that film to a district in o Ohio where we wanted to see, you know, is this, is this tool something that can actually shift the needle? And uh, we worked with a bunch of partners on the ground to screen that film and to try to understand, you know, what is it that this community needs in order to um, gather the momentum to make a difference? And it, it turned out that, that had, there had a, a representative um, that had come out against climate change. Uh, and after being in this town, the, the team moved there for six weeks um, and just screened the film over and over again with some of the non-traditional messengers. So it, not the choir, um, but we love the choir, um, but this is a, a story that's beyond the choir. Um, this is a human story, an adventure story. And through that, um, that congressman actually came out and changed his stance on climate change. He wasn't voting that way. Um, and, but it was, a, it was a step to say, you know, wow, there, there really is a power behind what film can do. And so with this film, we want to continue that work. How, how do we use the film to bring it to communities, to allow organizations to, to move uh, communities and people um, towards sustainability? And I think that's really what we're hoping to do now that it's great because Netflix is around the world. It can be available. Um, you can sign up for a free screen if, or trial if you don't have one. Uh, so that kind of access is really special. Um, but I think beyond that, we are hoping uh, that if we can go into some certain communities, especially here in the US, and, and allow the film to be used as a tool to congregate people, to start a, a conversation, um, that's the first step towards getting bridging a divide that may happen when you don't have an opportunity to to take people on a journey, um, and I think that's really the brilliance of what the storytellers have done is is to allow a conversation to happen through uh, a human story. Mm -hmm. Well done, I, I mean beautifully put. And what I love what you just said, and then Mark, I'd love you to add on yeah. to that because I know this is something that you're passionate about as well. Yeah. Um, Oh, I was going to say, uh, you know, there's no silver, bu silver bullet solution to climate change. Um, and that's what we didn't want to uh, say in this film. We didn't want to say, well, you know, all you got to do is do this one thing and climate change is done. Because it's, I think it's different for each location um, that you go. Uh, the problems that we're facing in Colorado are different than the ones that we're facing in Chicago or Illinois. Um, so I think what, what the impact campaign is doing is, is trying to gain empathy from the, um, the, the areas that they visit and find out what problems are they, um, are they wanting to solve uh, dealing with the environment and then uh, helping them congregate people and helping them give the tools to the people that are already solving it. Um, if you can do that, um, 
then yeah. maybe you can make a little bit of progress. And it's like, how, how do we how do we catalyze like a, a new wave of, of champions for the world that we live in? And I think that's what's really exciting to me is is there's there's a, an opening in a space, and I, I feel like Rich, Richard says this all the time, which is that for the last 100 years, we've thrown this incredibly awesome party. <laughs> and now it's time to clean it up. And I feel like I just got to the party. Like I don't, I don't really want to clean it up yet. Um, but, but actually what we have to do is we have to throw a better party. Well, how do we, how do, we do that? I think uh, you start to look at, like, well, who's throwing a better party? Well, Tesla. Tesla's throwing a better party. It's not like you choose their car because it's like the eco option, it's the environmental option. It's like that's the cool option, that's the cool car. So how do we change the way that we're looking at our systems, our transportation, our economics, is what's the cool option and make that the eco option. Then you don't have to choose eco, you just choose the good option. And you're not being punished in any way. I really love the way that you said that because I think sometimes I think we feel that somehow we are, um, we've been bad and we ne now need to be punished for how bad we've been. I think that's why a lot of people um, sort of back away from the envir from environmental issues because they're like, well, wait a minute, I didn't, I was just doing my little thing. Why are you, I, this isn't my fault. And I just love that the way you put it. And I think um, very intentionally, I'm guessing, is that the energy of the film is very young. It feels very young to me. And I mean that in a very complimentary way. I think because Vac Zach becomes your voice of the film, um, it's very much what you said. It's like if you're someone who's a young adult who is facing the world, it's like you don't want to have to face it thinking of loss, right? Yeah, well, so talk a little bit about that. It's also this, I think it's a, a piece of an idea, which is that, you know, th there's a lot of like pointing of fingers and a lot of blame. And I was always taught that like it doesn't help to play the blame game. Um, and my life is where it is today you know, because we rode on the shoulders of giants. We have what we have today because there was progress. And, and now there's just a different way. It's like the, the horse and buggy was really great and it got people where they got to because they, they needed transportation. And, and then the car came along and that was no longer relevant. Um, so I think that's just what's happening. There is a transition and I think, you know, there's, there's, an, exci there's an exciting moment that I think we have to have, and I think we as filmmakers do feel optimistic. Um, I think at the same mm -hmm. time, uh, the film sort of holds back some of the punches, and I think Davis talked about this earlier today, in that you know, the science is, is pretty depressing for climate change. The, the coral science is really depressing, and I never wanted to talk about that. So, so we, all we hear is doom and gloom, but I think there, there is a reality, um, which is that the corals do really need help, and we are, you know, kind of at the edge. Uh, and at the same time, there's so much more hope. Um, there's so much more excitement about what we actually can do, what we actually can change. And I think that, for me, is is the exciting part because maybe it is young and and kind of overly optimistic, but at the same time, it doesn't it doesn't feel like that. No. Um, mm -hmm. And we have seen some incredible changes happening incredibly quickly in terms of technology and the availability of solar. I think even uh, Davis also said when when Jeff started actually making this chasing ice. Um, solar panels and electric cars were not available at his price range. He now has both of them. Um, and, and that was only you know five years later. Um, so things are getting more affordable. Technology is increasing at a rapid rate. And so I think there, there is this exciting time for us to say, well, how do we re-envision the world that we live in? And how do we take what we, we have from this incredible past? And how do we actually transform that into something that's positive and good for the world that we live in? Um, you know, community organizers often say you change a city a block at a time. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about. I also think that, um, you know, shifting in awareness is the first step. And everybody has the ability to decide once they have that awareness what they want to do from there. And I, one of the things that I do like about the film is that no one is being told what to do. And I think even if all you do is shift your awareness a little bit, that's a change. Right. Absolutely. Not everybody is going to be able to do what these people in this film did because they're sort of remarkable, right? Not sort of, but they're pretty remarkable. And they really are sort of on the cutting edge of really trying to change things. But we can all be degrees back from that, and that's still just as legitimate, right? Absolutely. Um, and that's what I do like. It's like you didn't make it sound like we have to all go out and, you know, I don't know. 
get rid of our cars yeah. uh, I yeah. can't. No, no one person, <laughs> I think, is going to save the world. But yeah. we, we talk a lot about the power of film. Actually, we were talking earlier, too, about th that there's quantitative and qualitative ways to measure film. And I, I also believe that there is a space for filmmakers to just be filmmakers and, and to have art for art's sake. Um, at the same time, I think Jeff and Zach witnessed something that was so remarkable and so, you know, devastating that they felt this need to, to tell other people. When they when they came back from Australia, they were they were different people. I think um, a lot of the, the crew on our team have been different. Um, I, I, I think it's affected me, it's affected Larissa. It's it's like you when you have that knowledge, um, it's hard to kind of erase it. It's hard to like not do anything right. about it. Right. And I would actually pause because I know we're coming at this like very positive and hopeful, um, but I bet some of you out there probably don't want to hear that, mm -hmm. and that's totally fine. Um, and uh, and we've we've gone to a lot of screenings, um, and we've experienced a lot of different reactions to the to the screenings. And I would say like, you know, it's it's like uh, experiencing the loss of a person, you know, and you, and everybody goes through their stages of grief. And I think we've caught everybody at different stages of that grief. Some people. Are very angry and they they just don't think anything can happen from from this. Um, some people are very sad, like they come up after after the screen and just want to hug, um, and that's totally cool. Um, so I I think we're hopeful just because um, you know we've we've sat through a ton of interviews with scientists, um, usually telling the worst facts. And Larissa said like we we held back the punches in this in this film, but. Um, at the end of the interviews, you know, we'd always talk about hope, and what, and if the scientists are hopeful about it, that's that's what makes me hopeful about it. It's about the technology that can then, that can kind of keep the, catch up to uh, to the effects of climate change. Yeah, like Ove has been working on this science for thirty years. He's known about it for thirty years, and yet he still goes to work every day because he cares so much about the ecosystem that he has fallen in love with. So I, I think there there is this incredible power to film. Um, and and I think just like Mark and, and Jeff had both seen Indiana Jones when they were really <laughs> little, like age eight or something. <laughs> and y you can't measure the impact that a film has like that, but they both want to explore the world. They both want to be adventurous. They both want to seek out different perspectives. And they both want to fight evil, you know. <laughs> um, and, and I think that there's something so powerful about just a film being able to to inspire something in someone that you may never be. It's so intangible. Right. You don't um, know where, right, yeah. who it's going to inspire. I think about this in particular with younger audiences. You know, if you're showing this to children, you don't know who in that group is going to be that next Jeff or Mark. We um, had a, a, a student after the, actually the when Zach went into the classroom, which is at the end of the film, we had a student write a thank you note afterwards and it said, Dear Zach, when I grow up, I want to be underwater just like you. Oh. You know, so it's 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 the small things and it's the big things. And, I, and we feel really, I feel really optimistic. I should qualify. Some people <laughs> are still in different still phases of grieving. <laughs> right, right. But you leave us, like you said, you leave us hopeful. I also think that you made a film that really got to us emotionally, and I think that is that's one of those things that doesn't always happen with these issues, right? Um, is that it's told in such a way that um, we're either completely politicized about it, so we just sort of back away, or um, we're drowned in facts that don't really help us make sort of a um, you know that emotional connection. And I think you did a great balance between giving us the facts, but also like making sure that. Emotionally, we were invested in the film. So, well, congratulations to all of you. I think that that was a really. Um, I think that's part of why it's so powerful. And just tell me a little bit more about Exposure Labs because it sounds like you're on a roll now, right? We're, we're, so, what's next? Well, that is a it's a difficult question. Okay. Um, I think I think to go back to what you said that that to me is the best part about this film is. Um, Sometimes I feel like filmmaking can happen in a vacuum, and I think there are like the art, the auteurs that, that do everything. Um, and Jeff, in his own right, you know, he's wearing all the different hats. Um, but the thing that this film taught me was that there is such a power in the filmmaking friends in which you surround yourself. And um, I think it's a testament to, to Davis and to the editing team, to the sound design and Dustin's team, just the, the ability um, to tell a good story 
that then allows us to move an audience, that then allows us to have a conversation about what we can do. Um, and I think if we didn't have a good story, nobody would care to stick around to have a conversation that's exactly. about what we can do. Um, so I think the first and foremost was a focus, and that's really what I think Jeff and Exposure Labs tries to do, is how do we, how do we focus on telling the best story that we can tell? And then from there, now what can we do with it? How do we use this to help other people achieve the goals that they want to achieve? How do we help communities strive to be better communities? And I think the credits alone are a testament to, a, to obviously not making this in a vacuum. So um, I was impressed by that, the, the number of people that had something to do with this film. And I know you as the producer dealt with all of that. So, and there were 20 cameras. Do I have that right? We had we had over twenty camera people. Um, it was it, it, not at one time. Um, it took about three and a half years, I think, to make. We had different times, pe different teams out in the field documenting different things, and then the global call. I think at the end was, you know, people at some point we we couldn't be everywhere at once, and we needed right. to ask for help. And I, I think maybe Mark can talk a bit about what the the production was like and the different kind of environments in which filming had to happen. Yeah, I mean. For one, you couldn't get seasick while filming, um, and then <laughs> you mean you couldn't or could, you wouldn't? No, I wouldn't. You, I mean, that's just the, you had to the just requirements for this film. You yes. just couldn't do that. And then uh, another is just not getting camera wet. But um, yeah, I mean, I uh, just talking about my role. I uh, did a lot of the topside uh, filming for it. So um, you know, on, we went to the, some of the shoots. Actually, part of our Honeymoon was in the film. <laughs> the, oh. the part where the uh, the lightning um, is in the air and uh, someone off screen yells, uh, uh, Do, "Should we take down that metal thing?" Uh, that was my wife. Uh, Wait a minute, <laughs> you two are we are husband. Oh and yeah, husband. by the way, oh, I don't married, know that yeah. anyone knew that. All right, <laughs> yeah. did this happen because of this film? Uh, no, no, that's no, no, none of no, my no, business. No. Okay, never mind. No. We, um, <laughs> and the bleaching didn't happen because of our wedding. No, though, oh, but we, we had that's to go to follow hear. it. Yeah. Oh, wow. It started well, bleaching right after we were about to be married. And actually, the team came back from Bermudas and Bahamas after installing what we thought were successful installations. Right. Um, we, this is before we knew uh, that they weren't. Um, and we ended up going to, needing to Hawaii. change our trip to go to Hawaii to um, install more cameras. And, um, you know, Jeff. That was your honeymoon? Jeff always jokes that it was so, the best honeymoon you know, yes. he's been on. Well, but. at least it was Hawaii. But at least it was Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, my, my job was basically just, um, I mean, I, I felt like, uh, com uh, before this project, I've worked on a lot of like uh, short films and a lot of commercial stuff and kind of short subject stuff. And so you're filming for a particular reason. Um, on this one, uh, I caught myself like filming not enough, uh, I think. And Jeff kind of like told, told me to just keep rolling, keep rolling. Um, and I'm uh, sorry, Davis. I probably gave you like hundreds of hours of, of footage to work with, but um, but that's that's kind of what uh, that that helped um, because we were waiting for those moments where the divers would pop up and they would say something and yell something out. We just always look for the bubbles. Like, where are the bubbles? Um, and I would sometimes dive in the water and just kind of like see what was going on too. Um, but uh, yeah. Well, I just have to say one of the things I felt that worked really well was um, how seamless it was from the topside cinematography to the underwater cinematography. Like I always felt like, and I didn't realize, you know, you're doing one, they're doing the underwater, you didn't do any of the underwater, right? No, I didn't. But those sort of worked, that worked really well together. So, and again, that goes to Davis. It goes to the Davis. Nice yeah. job there. Seriously. It was a disaster yeah. on set, I have, no. <laughs> what did you say? It was, no, it wasn't a total disaster, but it's just, it's really difficult to film yeah. underwater and topside. And I think at the at the initial onset of the project, you know, Jeff thought, well, we, we can do everything, but you have to, you know, vacuum seal the camera into a dome so it doesn't get wet, and then you have to come up out of the water. You've waited it, you've waited yourself to get it out of that dome and then to start shooting and hooking up your microphone like there's so much time you've missed whatever some right. of your Richard had mm -hmm. said and so we ended up having to have two crews one underwater one topside but it worked very very well and it was a, a good solution yeah so I have a I want to ask about the um, party boat scene because that one really stuck out to me. I didn't fully understand it. Why were you guys on that party boat? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, so it just so happened that the, the reef that they were going to look at in New Caledonia um, was accessible only via this sort of uh, pontoon boat of sorts. Um, so they were actually diving off of there uh, every day to look at the coral. 
Um, and we actually ended up doing time lapses there as well, just like we did um, that you see at the end of the film. Uh, so it, it was just a boat that you know this person owned, and at one point in the day, they they had this big event, this big party, and um, it. It, you know, for whatever reason, they were just there, and I think it was it was quite a shock for Richard and for Andrew, who was there documenting it. So they're not all they weren't always there when you were using the boat. They weren't always there, but I, there were multiple occasions, um, and I, I think it, it, it's not even. A, I think Richard says it so so eloquently. Like yeah. it, it isn't even about them. No. It's just about the fact that you know this is how, like you said you didn't even know that corals were an animal most people don't know I didn't know right. that they were a rock a plant and an animal all in one right um, so it's like this whole world exists and we're just totally oblivious to the magic and also the devastation that's happening and were they really that oblivious to when you were filming too I mean that sort of surprised me that nobody even just looked around as you're you know you've got a camera behind you but they look he's beautiful. just come out of the water I mean Richard even said Richard even says like how are you supposed to think that this is horrible because because it's the most beautiful colors you've ever seen in right. your life. Like, right. you've never right. seen them in mm -hmm. nature. And we talked about that a little bit in the um, editing masterclass, because that was something I was I was sort of struck by, that, you know, you have to show us how beautiful the reefs are so we understand the loss. But I wondered if, you know, you had to make sure that the balance was such that we, we weren't thinking, well, what's the problem? Most of them seem fine. Like, you have all this great footage. Why should we be concerned? And I think you talk a little bit about that. Yeah. yeah, I think that's more of like a question for Davis. Too. We already covered Just, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it. But we can cover it later. I mean, it really is. Uh, throughout the editing process, there was this constant battle that, that Jeff and Davis would go through to try to understand, you know, at what point can we show bleached or dead coral? Because I wouldn't know what it was. Like, I had never gone scuba diving before this project. I would never know that that wasn't healthy, right. that that wasn't normal. Um, so they had to, you know, craft this narrative that allows us to see what a beautiful reef is multiple times. Um, and we learn about the different fish and the different types of coral and the colors and, and to, until you get to that point where it is dead. And, and now you know, you, f you can understand as a viewer that it is this like building blocks of, of language that, that Davis and Jeff were able and the assistant editors were able to kind of craft that so that we understand and we that can empathize right. at that stage. So does anyone else mention Finding Nemo? <laughs> I don't know why. We actually think Dr. James Porter's voice sounds a lot like Marlon. The yes, yeah, I yes. <laughs> but I think it was that uh, in the symbiotic portion of the film, and you show the anemone, uh, the anemone, and, yes, and, and, and an the anemone. Clown, like a little, yeah. Now I sound like one of the characters from it, but yeah, that did sort of occur to me at one point. But, yeah. Um, you know, funding. We talked a little bit about funding because I think obviously a film like this mm -hmm. with the number of people that are involved um, I'm sure you know was a considerable budget so um, talk about a little bit how you managed to um, finance films like this yeah so we we felt really lucky um, Jeff having had the success that he had with um, chasing ice was able to kind of reignite some of those relationships and um, when we had when Richard reached out to us via email and said I have this project we reached out to some of those original um, supporters and said hey there's this thing that's happening you know we had spent f five years we meaning the chasing ice team um, had spent five years uh, you know in the ice thinking that we understood a lot about what was happening in the world and then to find out that there's this whole other story that we had no idea um, you know that that these changes were happening um, that really excited I think a passion in people wanting to say well how do we show this how do we expose what's happening um, so th that was our initial sort of seed funding um, but it is it's an expensive process as any filmmaker I think knows um, and this even more so just in terms of the locations the amount of time it took yeah. um, and I think you know we we applied for grants I think we actually applied for 23 grants and I think we got two of them or three of them. What? So wow. really difficult process grant. I would highly recommend doing it um, or getting a professional to help you do it, but it, it's difficult. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really hard. Horrible. Um, and so I'm sorry to say, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's a necessary evil, but it's, there's, so, and, and part of this, not to cut you off, but part of this is that the funds out there to make films like this are shrinking. It is, it's you really know? And so there are all these talented people vying for the same yep. smaller and smaller pool of funds 
um, which just makes it more and more challenging for people who want to support films like this or you know give you a grant for this. There, yeah. yeah, there are some incredible granting organizations out there. Um, and, and we were lucky enough to be supported by Brit Doc, which is now Doc Society, oh, yeah. um, and Sundance Institute. Uh, so, you know, we feel super, super blessed that we had those kind of um, grants. But, but in addition to that, I think a lot of it was, you know, um, this story was unfolding and we didn't really know how big it was going to be. We didn't know the cameras were going to fail. Right. Um, we had invested a ton of money to try to make those cameras work and, and we didn't know that that was going to happen. So we sort of raised it in chunks as we went mm -hmm. along and we said, oh, we need to go film this. Yeah, or I think the earliest, like, f fundraising part happened after they came back with a bunch of, like, just beautiful footage, red footage of underwater and just like, take a look at this, like f let's fall in love with the ocean together and let's talk about where we want to take it next. Yeah, yeah. We, we, had, we cut a trailer I think together, a sizzle we would call Got it, it. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, to help us show that there's this, we can actually film underwater. I mean Jeff had, Jeff yeah. had gone diving I think four times before this project. He was really? not an underwater cinematographer oh before gosh. the project. So he went with a journey with the team to get certified, all types of certifications. Oh my gosh. Um, so it, you know, filming underwater is extremely difficult. Um, and really expensive, uh, so I think it w it was it was quite an undertaking, but it was done in, in pieces, and it was just I, the tenacity I think of the team to say we know it's happening, even when the cameras fail. It was like maybe the story is actually going to be you know that we don't actually capture the bleaching. And Davis I think did an interview with Jeff uh, that said you know we had to interview him and say what happens if we fail, right. um, and that could have been the ending that we knew it was happening, but we couldn't capture it. Um, that could have been a different film, a right? A very different film, but we kept going. I think that's an, also a testament to Jeff saying, we have to go, we have to document this, and unfortunately, this massive event happened and we were able to capture it, um, but it is, it's a really difficult process fundraising, and oh, I, yeah. I think it, it is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill, um, but it's also an <laughs> art. <laughs> yes, um, well put, yes, so. it's true. <laughs> and it takes its own level of tenacity, it does, for sure. It does. So, um, and do you have any specific reasons why in 2016 it was such a significant year beyond the facts that you gave us in the film? I was kind of curious about that. If, if there was anything specifically that made 2016 this remarkable year. I mean, we know why it was sort of a remarkable year, but we're not going to get into that. Yeah. But um, yeah, I was curious. I mean, um, it was a, it was an El Nino year, right? Um, and so, actually, El Nino played a much bigger role in the story. Um, Davis and the assistant editors were actually trying uh, a number of cuts in advance to try to weave that in so that we would understand uh, what El Nino was and why it was this kind of window into the future. Oh, okay. Um, but since uh, actually 2016. It's, it is no longer a window. Um, they now believe that bleaching will happen without El Nino. Um, so there's been somewhat of a, of a base change, and that science is um, in the works, I think. Uh, but I, it was, at the time, a, a way in which we were going to be able to showcase what the future could look like, and, and that kind of came a lot sooner than we uh, expected. I see. Okay. Um, and so what's the plan for the film itself? Um, Hopefully you have more screenings like this. Yes. It's on Netflix now, which is great. But tell us some of the other plans for the film, and um, and again back to you know what's the future of um, yeah. what you're going to be doing. Yeah, like we mentioned earlier, the uh, after the film was released at Sundance, uh, the team they hired a team of uh, four people. But we have we have a team of seven people, seven people. now. We, we I think after Chasing Ice, um, we saw that there is this kind of uh, ability for a film to have a, a long life. And uh, you know we're still getting requests for Chasing Ice screenings. And uh, after Chasing Coral, we, we thought, well, you know, why don't we, why do we create this whole machine to help get the film out and help raise awareness when actually you know, there's multiple films that could happen. So we have this team now that I think is, um, it's a seven person team and our goal is really to use the film and bring the film to communities that, so that we can um, allow communities to empower themselves to make the changes that they want to see. Okay, so, um, so you guys can go back to your filmmaking and you've got this team of seven people that are sort of independent of you 
but representing the film, well, taking are, it to community, or all, do I have this wrong? Yeah, we, okay. we are, we are, we are a one team, I would say. Um, we brought people onto our team oh, okay. uh, so that we could actually um, continue to make films, but also focus on the impact. So actually, um, Jeff and, and most of our team, Zach and Richard, are all out at screenings having conversations okay. similar to this one so that we can continue talking about it because, you know, the film is done, um, but we don't want it to just end there. Uh, and so our goal is really to, how do we continue to this momentum? How do we continue these conversations? Because it's not getting less important right. every day. It's getting more important, some would argue. Um, so it looks like we need to, I'm getting these little messages, that's why I keep glancing over there, um, that we're going to be switching to questions from the audience. Wonderful. Um, Could we invite our lovely oh, editor and yes. sound designer? Yes. Can we squeeze? Yeah, can you guys all squeeze in there? Somebody can sit on my okay, lap. There's a so we have chair. Dustin. Oh. Um, so this is Davis. Um, can you guys all fit, or do we have another chair? But I don't want anybody to fall off the. Yeah, we're fall staying. off the stage. We're we're a cozy family. They're cozy. Um, okay, go for it. All right. Um, first of all, thank you so much for an amazing film. Um, I want to especially compliment on uh, editing, and uh, my question is, um, how I know it, it took uh, almost three and a half years to make film. Um, how long it took to edit it? And um, um, that moment in the film about uh, cutting plastic out of the boxes was so special, was so interesting. And um, um, was it like originally you wanted to include it in there, or something somewhere in the end you decided to include it in there? Just <laughs> if you can tell us something about it. Um, gosh, I, you know, I think I I spent maybe almost a year mm -hmm. working on it, um, but it was start and stop, and, and there were two big pushes that we did. Um, uh, also, uh, we had th I had three other editors helping me, so, uh, and some of them started before, and some of them are still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it was, I mean, it was a moment, uh, uh, it was a huge task, it was a huge task. Um, and, uh, yeah, we had, we had like 175 terabytes of footage. Um, wow. So it was a lot, it was a lot to manage. <laughs> I know, how about that? Wow. Uh, wow. Uh, and, and as far as that, <laughs> that moment at the baggage check where they have to literally shave plastic off of the Pelican cases, um, you know, Jeff came back from that trip telling me about it and, and it was, it was sort of like, they were really set up to shoot. They were trying to check in, and so the, the quality of the footage wasn't that great. And it was kind of something that, you know, it was great, but like, we didn't realize how funny it would be, you know? Um, and we had, we had versions of it cut, and I think I, part of me always kind of thought like, I can't believe they're letting us keep this in there, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and a lot of filmmakers wouldn't have included that, but because so much of this film was about the process, and, and because that particular scene just showed so much of the spirit of the filmmakers, you know, they're, they're trying to check in and this giant pelican case weighs like a half a pound too much, and they, they you know, who, who does that? <laughs> who does that? I'm surprised the airport let them do that. But. A bit of a hot mess. Yeah. Yeah. As, as Larissa says in the film, I don't think the airport people are going to like it. Yeah, be yeah. very happy. They, they were not. <laughs> but they never like cruise that show up with all the with, you know, no. nine yeah. hundred pounds. It was a, a moving gear. van. Of, yes, of exactly. Yeah. Right, thank you. Okay. Hello. I thought it was fantastic. I was like crying in my seat. It was so moving, and yeah, it was something I knew nothing about. So thank you for making this film. Um, I wanted to ask about the funding again and like what the budget was and if you did any crowdfunding for it as well like other than just like private donors too it's a great question um, I can't I can't say that the total budget oh, okay. um, but I can say it, it was an expensive documentary <laughs> documentaries are getting more and more expensive uh, I feel like every day um, uh, we didn't do crowdfunding um, we we thought about it um, I don't know how many of you have ever run a crowdfunding campaign I ran one for my thesis film and it was more work than I think the money was worth. 
Um, but uh, we, we thought a lot about that. The thing about crowdfunding is that you can build an audience, you can create an audience. Um, that was what was really exciting to us about that prospect. Uh, but actually the global call, I think, was the, the most interesting part of it because we saw this dive community come together in a way that we never really expected. Um, so there are people to this day that are in the 30 countries around the world that are like championing this film and excited to be able to use it um, to, to educate their communities uh, in a way that I think any crowdfunding platform could have been. We, we crowdfunded videos instead of funding, I think. That's awesome. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just wanted to reiterate the, um, how moving it was um, and devastating at the same time. And I guess I'm going to ask a more scientific question. Um, so with the passing of the seasons and the cooling, pro probably the cooling of the oceans, will the coral um, come back to life? Yeah. Like all of the, the bleached coral? Or are they dead and there won't be new coral? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's a small window in which bleaching occurs. Um, so, you know, corals, uh, when they go through these higher temperatures, um, for about three to four weeks. If, if they can drop the temperature um, within that time span, they have a chance to survive. Um, but after about three to four weeks, they, they've reached this threshold where they can no longer survive and they, and they do die. Um, so a lot of the coral that you see in the film um, actually is, is dead, it's no longer here. Um, and, the, and the latest science is actually that we've, we've lost 30% uh, uh, of the great, tw uh, you know, 23% of the Great Barrier Reef in 2016, but we actually lost 50% between 2016 and 2017 of the Great Barrier Reef. So almost half of the of the Great Barrier Reef is gone. Um, that said, uh, the scientists are doing some incredible research uh, in the field to say, you know, what survived. Um, so Dr. Ruth Gates, who you saw in the film, is working on research around super corals. How do we um, figure out which corals are most resilient and, and how do we breed them to create these kind of like super corals that can withstand higher temperatures? Um, Dr. Joni Kleifus is working on coral reef restoration. Uh, so actually they, they grow corals in a nursery and then they plant them um, back uh, on the reefs. Uh, so, so there's like this really cool technology that's happening um, around corals and restoration, um, but we just have to give them a chance. If, if the water temperatures continue to stay hot, it won't matter how much coral we're able to replant um, if, if they continue to die. It's like, a, it's like planting a tree in a, the middle of a forest fire. Yeah. Like if we don't allow the conditions to be right, then they can't thrive. thrive. When you say super corals, are these genetically modified by any chance? Uh, they, they could be. Um, I'm happy to chat afterwards. I don't know as much as Dr. Ruth Gates knows about the research, but I can definitely point you to some resources. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Excellent. much. So that had to be our last question of the oh, evening. I know. Else. Time flies. Um, and so I just have to say thank you to all of you again for this fabulous film and for all of you being here at DePaul. We're so happy that you were here. Well, thank you um, thank all you. for being here. Thank you. This is fabulous. Thank you. Thank you.